welcome to our Smart VR talk on VR and sensory input. This webinar is hosted by the USC Smart VR Center, which is funded by the USC Office of Research. To learn more about our center and events, see our website at smartvr.usc.edu or follow us on Twitter at USC underscore Smart VR. Today, we will be featuring Aaron Wisniewski, co-founder and CEO of OVR Technology, and Joe Michaels, Chief Revenue Officer at Havdex. Co-hosting this event will be Dr. Skip Rizzo, Smart VR Co-Director and USC ICT Director of Medical VR. And with that, we can start with Aaron from Over Technology. Um, I'm on mute, now I'm not on mute, great. Um, Julie, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here um, with you and Joe and Skip and everyone else. Um, so I will uh, share my screen and talk a little bit about who I am and what I do. All right, can everyone see that? Julie, uh, Joe, yes. Skip, does that look good? All right. Yes, looks good. Yep. Excellent. Great. So um, in the pretty near future, XR is going to be everywhere. Um, we're going to do everything in virtual and augmented world. Um, and I think what surprises a lot of people is that scent, um, our oldest and most primal sense, will play a critical role in the success uh, of that virtual future. Um, sensibility to make our virtual experiences more emotional, more engaging, more valuable, and more effective is often overlooked, um, but should never be underestimated. Um, we only need to look at the recent impact of COVID to see what happens when we lose our sense of smell, um, even temporarily. Um, the biological, the psychological, and the social impact is pretty profound uh, in smell loss. Uh, in a recent article in the New York Times by Brooke Jarvis, she noted that people suffering from COVID-related smell loss struggled with depression, symptoms similar to those of post-traumatic stress disorder, and feelings of relentless isolation and disconnection from the world around them. Um, it felt, some people said, as if they were living their lives in black and white uh, or trapped behind a sheet of glass. Um, their sense of normalcy and well-being had completely disappeared along with their olfaction. So, I'm dedicated to harnessing the power of smell to ensure that our virtual experiences never suffer the same fate. Um, so uh, I'm gonna take a moment to talk about why our sense of smell is so powerful from a physiological standpoint. Um, it is unique from all of our other senses. Uh, it is the only one with a direct connection to the limbic system in our brains. Um, the limbic system is where our memories and emotions live. Um, and it's also what drives many of our motivations and behaviors. Um, so just think about all the times you've been walking down the street and caught a whiff of perfume or cookies or fresh cut grass, and then been instantly transported back in time to a moment in your past. Um, now our sense of smell, because it operates under the radar of our conscious thought, um, it can be undervalued or misunderstood, but that doesn't make it any less powerful. Um, so at OVR, we conceptualize, build, and deploy olfactory technology um, that brings that incredible complex world of scent into all VR experiences, making them more engaging, more emotional, more meaningful, and, and effective. Um, so we call this technique the architecture of scent. Um, and it's the first multi-sensory VR platform that intelligently understands user behavior in the virtual world and translates it into real-time olfactory stimulation. Um, so by leveraging our patented microtechnology, um, our software framework, and our proprietary scentware library, um, you can now make the virtual world feel more real uh, than ever before. Um, so here's how it works. <clears throat> uh, in the real world, um, smells are like this soup swirling chaotically around us in the air. Uh, and every time we breathe in, we get loads of information about our environment. So at OVR, we have reimagined that chaos as a set of predictable invisible geometries. And as you collide with them in the virtual world, our device receives wireless signals to release the precise amount of scent at precisely the right time. Um, and it's also spatial and positional. 
as your distance from objects changes, the relative intensity of odors changes appropriately. So this allows you to really, really accurately mimic um, the sensory world around you in VR. And it gives both developers and users and administrators a lot of control over how people interact with that world. <clears throat> um, and you know, we sometimes hear the argument that smell is nice to have, but not critical. Um, I would argue the complete opposite. Um, engaging senses beyond sight and sound like smell um, or touch in, in Joe's case is the only way to unlock the real potential of VR. Um, in our pursuit of the most powerful experiences, we are only really just entering the next era of immersive technology, um, which is the multi-sensory age. Um, for example, uh, if you were to watch a movie um, like on a small black and white TV with subtitles, you would absolutely understand the plots and you would know what was going on in the movie, but it's not a very engaging way to experience it. So of the 250 million TVs sold last year, guess how many of them were black and white? Zero, not a big surprise, because we are humans and we crave human experience. And since all human experience begins as sensory input, technologies like ours and other haptics are the obvious evolution and the next step in immersive technology. <clears throat> um, and we're far from the first people to try to do this by any means. I mean, people have been trying to domesticate this mysterious sense for decades, like really centuries, as far back as 3000 BC, um, ancient Egyptians were trying to capture the fleeting smell of flowers and spices. Um, Marcel Proust uh, writes about it in his book, Remembrance of Things Past. Uh, and some of us are even lucky enough or unlucky enough, depending on how you look at it, to remember Smell-O-Vision in the 1960s. And even though Smell-O-Vision was a colossal failure, it deeply resonated with us decades after its disappearance. Um, and as a culture, we have only become more and more obsessed with scent. Um, it generates $30 billion annually um, in scent-related spending. Um, and what's unique about virtual reality is it opens the door for a completely different approach to thinking about and applying this powerful scent, uh, sense to real world problems. <clears throat> so at OVR, we focus on the use cases that both align with our company values uh, and also where we think we can have the most positive measurable impact. Um, so we align with customers um, and partners that fall into three main categories, um, health, knowledge, and human connection. Um, so these can come in many, many, many different forms uh, in the form of meditation programs for better sleep, um, training for military medics, uh, for example, or even remote collaborations or remote interactions with friends, family, or coworkers. Um, but I'm gonna give you a, a few specific examples of OBR in the field right now. <clears throat> so um, one application within health and wellness that we feel really strongly about um, is stress. Um, stress has been described as a root cause of up to 90% of disease and illness. And the pandemic, not surprisingly, has only made um, our collective stress level even worse. Uh, so we wondered, how can we help? Um, well, we know that meditation works really well. Um, we know mindfulness practice works really well. We know breathing works really well. And we know spending time in nature works really well. So what if we were able to, um, in VR, combine all of these things into a single package that anyone can use anywhere and would truly enjoy that experience while also receiving genuine measurable benefits? So the result of that is a platform that we call Inhale. In Inhale, um, in this virtual world, a user can pick from a number of different photorealistic nature environments like a beach, uh, a waterfall, uh, a mountaintop, and within these environments, they are carefully led through a soothing, guided mindfulness meditation. Um, but this is a unique kind of meditation because unlike traditional meditation, um, you spend the entire time linking your breath with scent. Um, and that's a new thing. So the environments, uh, of course, smell like fresh outdoors, but the breath is focused on what we call totems. So handheld objects like citrus, uh, or flowers that are either relaxing or energizing. Um, and you use these totems to breathe in and breathe out with the meditation guide. Um, it creates a deep, effortlessly focused state of relaxation very quickly, um, and it can associate a positive mood state with a rewarding smell. So among a number of different applications for inhale, it's currently being used um, to ease discomfort in medically assisted rehab and detox clinics, 
uh, as well as a tool for stress reduction prior to group or talk therapy um, and a number of other use cases that um, uh, I can get into in the question and answer session later. Um, last year, an early prototype of the inhale platform uh, was used in a pilot study at the University of Vermont Medical Center to explore the effects of stress relief for short-term inpatients at the Department of Clinical Psychiatry. Um, the, the study was about 50 subjects and nearly all 50 participants uh, benefited to some degree um, from the experience and the average reported reduction uh, of feelings of stress was over 60%, that's the average. And what's even more exciting is that the reduction of stress largely remained even hours after the OVR session was finished. Um, so it's not just during the experience that you receive the benefits. So, you know, this research is still early um, and in no way does this indicate uh, a treatment or a cure of any kind, um, but it shows a great deal of promise um, for multisensory VR and it definitely uh, warrants further investigation and, and further use. Um, we also are currently working with Dr. Skip Rizzo, whom many of you may know, uh, on integrating OVR technology into the Brave Mind program, uh, which is a VR suite for clinicians to use during PTE, uh, PET for war veterans who are suffering from post-traumatic stress. Um, because of the very strong relationship between scent and memory, um, smells can be a powerful tool to trigger buried trauma and help people revisit and reprocess difficult memories in a safe controlled environment. Um, the link between scent and memory, interestingly enough, is not proportional though. Um, the more intense the initial experience, the more powerful and permanent the scent memory association is, and therefore the more powerful the trigger. Uh, to this day, one of my best friends, uh, who's a Vietnam veteran, um, still has trouble driving through areas with road construction because the smell of freshly paved asphalt is such a strong trigger for him. <clears throat> Um, another very immediate, very practical application for OVR that is closely related to health outcomes is training and simulation for high-risk occupations like military, police, fire, and rescue, um, as well as dangerous jobs in industries like oil and gas, for instance. Um, the cost and risk of real-life training simulations is way too high. So virtual reality presents a cost-effective, safe, and flexible model uh, to prepare people for these high-risk, uh, high-stress scenarios and therefore mitigate injuries, trauma, or even death. Um, and the introduction of olfaction not only makes these training scenarios more immersive and more realistic and, and therefore more effective, but also can be used as a mechanic in itself to better prepare people for working in the field. Um, for example, being able to properly identify different hazardous smells before entering a dangerous scene can be a life-saving skill for firefighters. <clears throat> Um, and finally, looking a little bit more into the future, um, we think one of the biggest drivers of VR is the social aspect. Um, VR democratizes experience and sharing these experiences is hardwired into our DNA. Um, and in our non-virtual lives, scent is so woven into the fabric of our day-to-day -day that most of us don't even actually realize how big and powerful a role it plays. Most people have used smell in the form of personal fragrance over 30 times before they even leave their house in the morning to go to work or wherever. And most of those applications are to position us or influence, influence us in a certain way socially. Shampoo, deodorant, mouthwash, fabric softener, perfume, et cetera, are all forms of smell influencing social behavior. Uh, and that's not even getting into all the chemical signals, sometimes referred to as pheromones, that we use to communicate socially that we don't even realize we're inhaling, but still play a major role um, in how we think and how we act and how we feel in those, socials, in those social settings. Babies recognize their mothers through smell long before they do using their eyes. Um, and it's actually even believed that the, the reason we romantically kiss each other is because of smell. Um, see, we each have our own specific odor signature that is even more unique than our fingerprints or a retinal scan. Um, and it contains worlds of information about each one of us, including data about our genetics and our immune system. Um, so it's thought that kissing is actually a way for two people to sample each other's genetics and conclude whether it's a good evolutionary match or not. Um, so one day we hope to be able to incorporate this level of olfactory richness into our virtual world to make our social interactions as meaningful and rich and deep and authentic as our non-virtual ones. So, you know, I'll kind of leave with this thought that 
I feel like the, the universe uh, of immersive technology is still really young. And in this universe, you know, as matter is beginning to coalesce around different applications and technologies, there is one common thread to all of it. We are all trying to create rich human experience. And since human experience starts with our senses, um, in order to really, really succeed in fulfilling the promise of this technology and have it reach its true potential, we need to engage every single sense. Thank you. Okay, well, that was, uh, that was an illuminating presentation, Aaron. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I've got a few questions, but I'm going to hold off until uh, Joe presents on the haptics, and then we'll we'll dive in with a conversation ourselves, and uh, and then open it up to some brave souls in the audience that want to ask some questions. Thanks, Skip. Cool. Catch you on the other side. Wow, that was fascinating. Uh, thank you for that, Aaron. I'm trying to imagine what you're office smells like. I just have this vision that you can kind of walk in and you, you're walking through waves and waves of different smells. Um, and so uh, this, I'm really uh, excited to, uh, to talk to you all today. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, so you should be able to see uh, the slide presentation, Skip. Yes, thank you for nodding. Good. Okay, cool. So um, my name is Joe Michaels, as you've heard, and um, I am the Chief Revenue Officer at Haptex Corporation. And uh, I put my um, Twitter handle at the bottom and the company Haptex's Twitter handle in case you want to follow us. Uh, we love to communicate about this topic. And, you know, it's pretty awesome that uh, we were invited to share this topic with you today. And the topic is enhancing VR through touch. Um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a very cool uh, topic. And, and I think you're gonna see a lot of similarity uh, between what you just heard from Aaron and what we have to say, because um, this idea of enhancing a spatial environment and the way that you experience it um, by bringing your senses into it, um, there are a lot of, lot of thematic similarities as you, you think about senses like touch and, and smell. Now, um, let me just give you a super brief, uh, background on Haptex. This is a nine-year-old company. We are the leading provider of realistic haptic technology. And uh, we recently announced that we've raised $31 million since we were founded nine years ago, uh, all in the service of uh, building out a vision where you can have a full body, uh, fully immersive, touch-enabled spatial experience. Um, and we are working toward that step by step. Um, I mean, to show you how complex and, and challenging technologies like this can be, um, again, nine years of research and development, $31 million. January of 2021, we launched our first commercially available product. It's what you see on the screen, the Haptics Gloves DK2. So this is, um, this is stuff that, that doesn't happen overnight. And so what I want to talk about is, is the you know, sensory input through a different organ, not the nose, as you just heard about, but you know, the largest one on your body, your skin. And uh, let me see if I can advance this here. Oh, uh, cool. Hang on. So let me see. Um, give me one sec. Are you, are you seeing the next slide yet? I need someone to just uh, hang on. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I'm going to. Oh, I am advancing it on my end. I'm sorry, and not on your end. So let me just um, let me just stop sharing that, and I'm going to share it one more time. Okay, and I will bring this up and. Let's see if I can. Oh, it is still not doing it. Okay, I'm going to share a different way. Um, sorry, guys. I thought I had this ready. Um, let's see. So when I share this, 
and I still can't move it. Wow, I apologize, guys. Give me one second. Let me think of a different way to do this. I'm going to, um, okay, and I'm going to stop this and share one more time. Um, are you seeing? Wow, next. And it still won't. Oh boy. I what about, are you running in slideshow mode? I, um, yes, I am. Uh, try on, on slideshow moding it and see if you can manually move them. It might, won't be as impressive. But yeah, let's see. Maybe that do might that. be a solution. Let's see if we can do it. I appreciate your help. I, I do this every day of my life and I still. I know. I, these things still, always work, usually. Um, okay. And then, all right. Um, so get out of slideshow mode. That's the right way to do it. Then the right way to think of it. Okay. So I'm just going to go here and okay. And I, I will have it momentarily. Okay. So you should see. Yeah. And we can see everything. We can see your little postage stamps on the left. I'm going to move that out of the way. Okay. So I will get this as. You know, maybe I once can... you're in now, if you hit slideshow mode, it'll pop up in slideshow mode just to try it and did see. That, did that work? It's, yeah, it's in slideshow mode for me. Advance it and see what happens. Yes. We good? Yeah, okay. okay. I appreciate your patience, everyone. Boy, technology can be frustrating. Okay, good. Here we are. Okay, so the reason that Haptex um, got into this field is we took a look at uh, the trend of modern computing. Uh, when you go back to you know PCs in the 1980s through the internet and social media and mobile, we, we saw two trends. Uh, one is increasing connectedness. Uh, people are getting uh, you know, connected around the world with each wave. Uh, advancing. And the, the other is increasing immersion. Each new form of computing is finding new and, and more exciting ways to bring the world together and get them more immersed in the content that they're seeing. And uh, as you look at, at where we are today, there's a new wave of which is feels like the logical extension of those two trends. And that's immersive computing, spatial computing. And um, it's not a surprise that all of the major technology companies are contributing in their own way to what uh, Facebook is now calling the metaverse uh, or, or this, this spatial computing wave. And most of the energy on the hardware side is going into spatial audio and uh, 3D video. Not surprising, those are two primary senses. But the thing that really got exciting for us is what about what we look at as the third leg of the stool? And you know, maybe Aaron would argue that the nose is the third leg, but we think of touch uh, as the third major sense to bring into immersion in spatial computing. And no one really has, has uh, uh, nailed that one. And, and we wanted to and still want to because uh, for us, touch is absolutely fundamental to the human experience. Uh, we think of this uh, as, as fundamental because from the moment that a human is born, he or she uses it to understand what's real. And one of the fascinating things about touch is it's made up of a bunch of different modalities. It's not just one uh, thing. It is tactile feedback and force feedback and vibration and thermal feedback. And they all combine together to uh, give us what we, what we understand to be touch. What I want to talk about briefly first is vibration, because this is what most people think of when they think of touch. And that's number one, because it, it is an important element of it. Um, and number two, it's because it's what every what, what most devices today uh, you know, use to convey touch feedback. So mobile devices, you tap your phone and you hit the right spot and it it buzzes a little bit to give you a, a sense that you, you you've contacted it. Or um, you, you're, you're getting a symbolic sense of contact uh, through a game controller. Uh, you fire a weapon or you crash your car or you know, something happens and there's some rumble to convey symbolically that, that you, you, know, you, you touch something. 
And then there are haptic gloves uh, today. Uh, typically, we think on the lower end of fidelity that, um, that have a few sort of rumble zones or, or vibration zones to, again, symbolically convey that sense of touch. But what I want you to understand is that touch feedback is really a whole lot more than vibration. Um, for example, tactile feedback um, think of the last time that you picked up uh, a porcupine. Uh, it was not vibration that was uh, giving you that sense of contact. It was the, the feeling of each individual quill um, pressing into your skin and giving you that sense of, uh, of, of touch contact. And that's how you perceive it. It's the tactile feedback at work. Vibration could never hope to do that. Um, and force feedback. When you're petting your cat and, and your hand strikes the edge of, of your cat's cute little skull and you feel, or you, you, you sort of gently grip it, you, you feel the size, the shape uh, of that object. That's the force feedback at work. And so what we really focus on most at Haptex is the tactile, because that is what really tells the story of touch and what it is that you're touching. It's when it basically comes through the displacement of your skin. As you see in this image on the left, you're, you're, you're pressing against something and your skin is being moved by that object. And, uh, and is that, it is that movement, uh, sometimes just a, you know, less than a millimeter, sometimes up to maybe two or, or three millimeters, that is, is what is giving you a, a real clear sense of what you're interacting with. And the science behind it is these mechanoreceptors that you see on the right um, under the surface of the skin. There are four different types. Um, the Pacinian corpuscle at the very bottom, uh, it's sort of farthest away from the surface of the skin. That's, um, that's gonna perceive the, the kind of vibration level of feedback, but, but it's, it's three, the three others that you see listed here that, are, um, that make up about 90% of, of these nerves that are really uh, picking up all the tactile feedback. And that's why tactile feedback is so important. So what Haptex does to address this is create a, a microfluidic approach to delivering tactile uh, and, and other types of feedback. So we invented this silicone material. It's a thin piece of, uh, of silicone. It's a, there's, this is a close-up view. And we push fluids, uh, in, in this case, air, through the material. And the air is channeled in such a precise way that it can uh, cause each one of these individual actuators on the surface to rise or fall uh, with full proportional control to each act activator. And so when you are touching this, your, when your real skin is up against this material, um, we can displace that skin, your skin, uh, and simulate with a lot of precision and realism and authenticity uh, the feeling that you get when you touch a, a real object. Uh, even if it's a digital one, you get to feel like it, you're coming in contact with a real one. And um, I will uh, spend the next 15 seconds uh, doing a commercial and try to avoid that for the rest of my talk. But the Haptex Gloves DK2, which we came out with earlier this year, is uh, really the only haptic glove that can give you that realistic sense of tactile and touch feedback because we put 133 of those actuators inside each one of these gloves. And we array them in such a, a way that all the places where your hand is typically contacting an object can, they can feel that, that sense of, of skin displacement and, and touch. We have 133 of those actuators inside each glove. Uh, we also have the strongest force feedback in the industry and the most accurate motion tracking, uh, our fingers are, are tracked uh, with six degrees of freedom uh, and, uh, and uh, with sub-millimeter precision. So we're very excited about this, this tool that you can use to convey touch uh, in VR. And so what's really exciting, what I wanna talk about today is how you use touch, how you use haptex gloves or, or other types of, of touch feedback to, uh, to enhance your, your experience in VR. And uh, I think the, the biggest opportunity is broadly speaking, training and simulation. And um, what we're excited about is helping users build real muscle memory in VR. So you're in virtual reality, you can naturally use your hands, you can drop the controller, uh, not learn how to work the world through triggers and buttons, but use your fingers and your hands the way you want to and, and do in the real world. And uh, you can do that over and over again in training. So, uh, and do it with enough accuracy that you can build 
real muscle memory. You're not just learning about the skill, you're learning how to do it. So here's an example, uh, surgical training. This is a UK company, Fundamental VR, and we brought our glove into it so you can feel the skin tissue and the bone cavity of the area that you're operating on in this uh, surgical example. And you can interact with virtual tools, uh, forgive the bone and gore here, but um, the idea is to really be able to judge um, the success of uh, a surgical per procedure thanks to haptics um, involved in it. And there's a lot more beyond you know, that kind of fine uh, motor skill. Uh, there, there's so many industrial and enterprise and government applications that require you to interact with controls, switches, buttons, dials, tools, um, and just the world around you. And if you do it with enough uh, accuracy, then uh, people avoid negative training. They learn how to use their hands correctly and they build fine motor skills, they build gross motor skills, and, uh, and the training can be a lot cheaper, safer, and more effective. So that's, that's really exciting, but I wanna talk for a moment about um, a flavor of, of training, which is kind of rehabilitation and recovery. And you know what, what we learned is uh, people who experience strokes, for example, often um, lose uh, their ability to, to sense. And so uh, through their hands. And so they need to recover. And we're excited about uh, testing the use of haptic gloves in that recovery. Um, so they can regain uh, slowly and correctly their tactile sensation and uh, engage in that kind of fine neuro rehabilitation. Uh, this, this is a, a, a wide open field and uh, something we're excited to work with USC on and, and, and others. And it's not just the fine motor skills. Imagine um, a 3D computer generated gaming environment designed to rehabilitate um, other parts of your body. Um, and, uh, and you can bring the sense of touch into it. And um, one of the great things is it's all bits and bytes. It's all software. So we are measuring and analyzing everything. So we can tell the, the, the doctor uh, or the therapist and the patient how well they're doing uh, and in real time give them the kind of feedback that helps them understand how to uh, how, how to do better and how to learn better and how to improve and so we think there's some really exciting opportunities in this kind of physical rehabilitation and then finally there's this um, possibility for addressing phobias and fears um, we we can imagine uh, a hyper-realistic visual program combined with our realistic haptics and um, imagine being able to dial up or down the level of kinesthetic uh, and tactical and tactile rather um, interactions with with the thing that you're afraid of and uh, slowly bringing the uh, the patient through their fears and uh, and 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 helping them to improve and recover. And so there, there's a, you know, there, there was a funny story where we learned just how impactful this can be when we went to a military conference and we had been turning the spider effect on automatically um, in every demo we did. And one of the larger, uh, tougher looking soldiers put on our gloves and we introduced the spider, which leapt into the soldier's hand and uh, the soldier screeched like a baby. And we realized, okay, you know, we should not assume that people are okay with spiders. Uh, there's a very strong impact that the tactile feedback can have when you combine with scary visuals. Um, so we, we've learned to, to ask for consent before we, before we terrify. Um, so um, one more thing I wanna show you is collaboration with haptics. I think it's a really exciting new area We've got this working where you can have multiple people in an environment. Imagine a, a therapist and a patient or two people training together or just interacting. And when you toss objects back and forth, they can land correctly. The physics, the haptics work just right. And now you are working on the same objects at the same time. This is really the future of virtual collaboration where you really feel literally like you're in the same space. And the cool thing is it's not just you know, collaboration, there's a human interaction that you can get when you're, you're physically together and, and you can interact with each other. And uh, I think someday we're all gonna just expect 
that we uh, as avatars will will interact very physically and realistically with each other. So uh, before I wrap up, I just want to share very briefly that um, uh, for those of you who are interested in haptics, you should know that they, they can be used uh, for robotics, not just for virtual reality. You can wear uh, haptic gloves and you can control robot hands with great precision and feel on your fingers in the gloves what the robot is feeling. And this is a fascinating new field uh, that lets you operate this robot very naturally and get these robot hands to do just about anything a human can do, um, which is really exciting. You can get them to do it from any distance. And um, it's just been incredible to watch how, how our customers are putting this to work. Um, and uh, you start thinking about health applications and telehealth, telemedicine, um, and so many other uh, ways to use robotics uh, when you can feel in real time what the robot is feeling. Um, so we, we had a moment where uh, a certain um, bald-headed spacefaring CEO um, tried our gloves and let out a laugh, which you can't hear in this animated GIF, but, um, but it, it was quite a laugh. And um, he looked a little bit like a comic book supervillain, and um, it was a fun moment for us and for the internet. Um, so anyway... Uh, with that, I just want to say thank you very much for listening to this talk, and I hope you will visit haptex.com if you want to learn more about our brand of touch in VR. Um, here are my Twitter uh, and the company's Twitter handles, and I really look forward to hearing people's ideas and questions and reactions as we go forward. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Joe, for very insightful and uh, important presentation. Um, I don't want to gobble up all the time, but I want to just make some, some quick comments on both of the, the topics and then uh, ask her just a couple of questions and open it up to the audience. Um, you know, the, the idea of integrating haptics and scent, you know, it's not, you know, people have been thinking about it for a long time, but it's been uh, a real challenge. And I would say that, that the haptic sense of touch, proprioception, these are the biggest, some of the biggest sensory challenges to introduce into VR. Uh, people have tried it with very expensive exoskeletons and mechanical robotic devices. Um, and the same thing with scent. Um, you know, a, maybe the, the mechanical element is a little bit different, but the chemical element is also equally challenging. Uh, we actually, with the PTSD work, had used a very cumbersome and primitive device uh, to add scent into the therapy. Uh, you know, nasty scents, diesel fuel, rotting garbage, burning rubber, combat related scents. Um, but it required a big box and a compressor, an air compressor. Uh, it was expensive and it filled the room with the scent and the scent stuck to people. So they walk out of the therapy session smelling like, you know, a, a Humvee wreck, wreckage. <laughs> um, and so, these are real challenges. Now, with that said, I see a lot of value for both of these senses being integrated into clinical applications. So, of course, scent activates emotion and memory directly intimately linked with the limbic system. Um, it, it's really, a, I don't want to say a no-brainer because that would be opposite of what the point I'm making. It is a brainer. Um, and so, it, you know, it makes a lot of sense Oh, another uh, pun, uh, to do this, um, to integrate these types of things. And same thing with haptics, you know, in the work with, with uh, physical rehab, VR has always been sort of hamstrung um, without, with the absence of a primary sense that people use in their everyday life when they're going through the rehab. Yes, we can do range of motion, we can do bimanual coordination, supination, pronation, all those things. Um, and it may be less reliant on having that sensory input. But if you're really gonna move the field towards um, promoting generalization to functional abilities in the real world, having a sense of touch, the, the whole collection of these things may be a real important element. I remember, God, it must've been 2004, I went to um, Dan Talman's lab in Sweden and he had this giant robotic armature device for each arm it was built by a company called Immersion Corp. And it was like $400,000. And it was breaking down all the time. And to program it, to register, to act things in the, in the world. So that long preamble about the importance of these things in clinical applications, I want to ask both of you, 
this one question. And that is, um, there's a lot of companies that have had great visions for improving healthcare applications using VR and simulation technology. The idea was sound, the vision was sound, they developed things, really prototypes and everything, but they couldn't make a market to survive um, exclusively in healthcare. That may change in the future. Um, how have you both thought about um, expanding your market so that there were, what are the other, and you touched on a little bit, but I like a little more detail from a business perspective, how you've, how you're ensuring your survival if you're not getting hundreds of thousands or even tens of thousands of units shipped to healthcare clinics and rehab centers and clinician offices and so forth. How do you intend to, to keep, keep the lights on in the long run? Uh, Aaron, you want to go first since you started first? Yeah, sure. Um, this is a big question. Um, and this is definitely not a short-term play. I think anyone who's in this game understands that um, not only is this going to take a long time, but it, we're up against a lot of um, a lot of barriers um, and a lot of naysayers. You know, um, there's just an article in Wired that came out that was kind of like, eh, "VR is not so great." And I think you know, I, I get the 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 emotion, but. I think we're in it for the long haul. And if we look, every indication is pointing that this is going to be everywhere in five or 10 years. Um, and I think some of the, the business ventures that failed in the past were a little bit too early. I think we have the advantage now, and this is before I get to like our business philosophy, we have the advantage now that VR technology itself has not only progressed quite a bit in the last few years, um, it's come down in price a little bit, but there's also a lot of other things going on right now that are pushing it to the tipping point. 5G infrastructure, for instance, is kind of offloading a lot of the computing power um, that will allow uh, a reduction in price, which will allow a map, you know, more mass adoption of headsets, which will drive more high quality content, which will drive more use cases, which will in turn kind of like create a, a bigger, broader adoption in the ecosystem. So I think the timing now uh, is much better for folks like us. Uh, and also to your to your point earlier is di diversifying use cases and engaging partners. Um, so healthcare is obviously a big focus for us from a values uh, standpoint and also a commercial standpoint. But you know we view kind of the Intel inside model for ourselves and um, you know Joe, I'm, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm assuming it's it's kind of similar in a lot of ways. You know, folks like us um, and HTC and HP and, and Joe, if we work together to create standards, software standards, industry standards, um, and so we're all rowing in the same direction, um, then the rising tides lift all, all ships model will create a kind of multi-sensory VR as a standard, maybe not for everything. You know, I'd be the first to say that uh, not all use cases benefit from scent equally, you know. PTSD therapy, high impact, high importance. Um, you know, uh, UPS training, maybe not quite as much. Um, so I think that the more that we work together, um, the more that we demonstrate commercial value and like a long track, track record of success commercially, and the more we invest in meaningful research, um, the quicker we're gonna get to where we're inevitably going anyway. Um, so I think it's just a question of, of, of when and not if. Nothing to add. That was exactly exactly right. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, okay. Well, I'm gonna. I just posted a link in the chat about an article that I just reviewed for a Journal, and I can't share it because it's still under review. But all the reviewers seem to concur. It's a great article on the neuroscience and uh, the use of scent in PTSD. But it talks about other uh, app areas, and it really provides a nice scientific detailing of the importance of scent um, in these areas as you move forward. So I posted the link to that journal so that you can check periodically. And maybe when this gets posted live, I'll put the link when the article is uh, published, which will be probably very soon online. Um, I think if you're interested in scent generally, but also one use case, but expanded use cases for uh, use of scent in clinical applications. This would be a go-to article. Uh, I was really impressed with it, very readable. Um, 
the next thing I'm going to post in the chat, and it's going to lead into a question uh, for Joe. And that is, this was an image I found a while back. I don't know if it's, yeah, it's, it's uploaded, but you can't, I think you have to download it yourself to see it. It's a full body suit haptic um, device. It says Haptex uh, Axon VR. Um, and Axon VR is a company that focuses on training police officers. So I was wondering if this was actually your application uh, a full body suit with these actuators. Yeah, there we go. Um, and it, you know, it's a visionary concept. How far are we away from this? Is it feasible? Is it going to be ten million dollars, or uh, it's, it's it's not going to be a couple hundred, certainly. Uh, but anyway, well, tell tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, this is absolutely the vision that inspired our founders, uh, Jake Rubin and Dr. Bob Crockett, to to start our company and. It's, uh, it's exciting because of what you can do with it. Once you um, have a, an exoskeleton that provides force feedback on your full body and you have a, a, a haptic suit delivering you know, tactile uh, feedback to, to all of your skin and you have haptics gloves um, and you combine that you know, with, um, with, with 3D visuals, you can effectively simulate any activity or behavior. Um, you can uh, do something productive or completely unproductive, and it feels realistic. And we're, you know, we started out imagining games incorporating this, and we've since given that up and realized that enterprise use cases are the ones that will pay the bills in the short term. Someday we'll, we'll return to games. But the, the answer is it, is it isn't cheap. Um, but the way that we're going about it is by saying, let's try to come up with the most realistic, the most immersive, the most effective technology, even if it's too expensive for consumers to start. And over time, we'll figure out how to get the cost down, get a form factor that, that can be more widely um, uh, available. And um, we, the, when you think about how long this takes, um, you know, it's not a 20 year problem to, to go solve. It is going to happen a lot sooner than you think. The National Science Foundation funded us and some universities to start working on the lower body uh, side of this. Um, we're doing incredible work in our labs um, to, 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 to work on other parts of the body. We'll have announcements we can make in the future. Um, you really need to add more feedback beyond the hands to really immerse someone in a virtual environment and um, to, to make something feel heavy, to let them rest their arms on something, um, and so much more. And we can't wait to, to get to this vision. We started with the hard part, the hands, and, and we're, we're making incredible strides. Right, I'm going to ask a question I know everybody else is thinking, but is too um, chicken to ask. Uh, but you don't have to answer it. Have you gotten any queries or investment from the porn industry? Funny how neither one of us is leaping to answer that question. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, who goes first on that one? Uh, <laughs> the, the answer is we have gotten inquiries. Yeah. Okay. And, right. and not uh, we have nothing to announce at this time. Um, likewise. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you got, you got to give the the industry credit for driving the internet, for driving VHS way back in the day. Um, it just doesn't happen to be in our uh, on our roadmap. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, some someday offline, we'll 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 share stories in this forum. Over nothing here. to say, nothing to share. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that, um, we've got about fifteen, a little bit less, uh, for audience questions. So, who's going to be the first brave soul to jump in and ask our presenters a question? Cameron Williams raised a hand. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Awesome. This is for Aaron from OVR Technology. I was actually talking to Wes Davis a couple of um, months ago about your uh, technology because I've interacted with a couple of um, health and wellness companies because I do audio production and they've gotten into extended reality as well as um, virtual reality for their products. And I noticed with your headset, um, I know it's mostly within audio as well as set and visuals, but I didn't see too much in regards to the audio sense. So I was trying to see... Um, how do you guys, of course, um, try to balance between the two? Because I know usually just in a realistic fashion, 
where like if I would smell my mom's home cooked meals, I know she's probably using the um, hearing like, you know, the, the fryer or like the pan and in the stove and everything to make it really immersive. It's like, oh, it's Sunday, <laughs> you know, it's not <laughs> some food. I mean, also in regards to audio, it's um, when it comes to humans, like language and speech and everything are different, like telephonic or uh, geophonic and biological phonic sounds. Um, it just sounds, but also have meaning and humans over time allow it to have meanings and everything. So long story short, I was just trying to see um, how do you guys really go about it uh, with the audio as well as the smell and everything. And if you guys um, do, uh, was there anybody you partner with or work with the staff, et cetera? Or... Yeah, there is a, there's a few questions in there and they're all excellent questions. So first I would say that when we were designing our software interface, you know, how do we add scent to these uh, environments uh, and make it realistic? Um, we, we borrowed a lot of concepts from audio engineering and from sound, you know, like spatial audio turned into spatial scent, um, positional, a lot of the same things, intensity, action curve. So we borrowed a lot of those concepts and applied them to the olfactory world. So when you think about like, oh, if I'm a developer and I'm adding olfaction, you're going to go about it in a very similar way. It's as if you're working with a sound engineer and musician. So I think that's, you know, like you touched on something like really on point there. Second is um, when we introduce scent into an environment, there are some use cases where the scent alone, um, and this is, this is true in the PTSD um, category, where the scent alone is a mechanic within itself. But for the most part, the scent really has to work with the audio, visual, the other senses to create the experience. Like no one thing does it on its own. And one of the most important things in virtual reality for presence and immersion is um, congruency and continuity. So like you said, your grandmother's house, if you were to smell one thing and hear something that doesn't line up, then it doesn't work. Um, and so, for scent, we want to pair scent with the right sound, the right sight, and the right touch in this case, um, but not always necessarily um, give all the answers. Your brain is really good at filling in some of the blanks. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons that 3D glasses and movie theaters never really, really took off because you're good at creating depth with a 2D screen. You're good at inserting yourself. And then when you break that immersion and you don't do a great job of it, it, it throws you off. So we do wanna leave room for the brain to fill in some of the blanks. And so if we provide the right canvas using um, you know, sight, sound, and smell, um, then your brain will create, if you insert yourself, you'll create your own experiences or insert your, your own memories to a large degree. Um, and to answer your final question, we work with a number of different content creators. Some of them um, have their own uh, you know, audio departments, but there isn't one particular you know, sound engineer or musician that we've worked with in the past. So I'm um, happy to chat again offline. Thanks, Cameron. Awesome. That was, thank you so much. I would love to talk more about it too. We have more time and everything and such, so. Likewise. So, do you have anything to add on that uh, in terms of uh, sound and haptics? I mean, we're talking multi-sensory VR here, so. Well, the only thing I'll say is that um, uh, game engines and 3D environments today, you know, do a great job of associating properties with the objects that we want to interact with. And um, these, these objects can generate sound, they can, you know, generate touch feedback, they, you know, I assume these objects can also trigger smells and, and um, thank goodness for, you know, for the excellence in Unity and Unreal Engine and, and others, you know, to, to sort of make it easy for developers to, you know, to, to sort of associate um, sensory input and, 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 uh, and just other kinds of properties with uh, individual objects. And that's, you know, that's sort of a developer's dream. And um, you know, someday it'll be a lot, even easier, I would say, to, to just, you, you, you create an environment, create a game, create a project, and everything, all the senses are, are, are immediately part of it. We're nowhere near there yet, but, but it's a pretty exciting vision that I think we're getting to. See, that, that underscores the unsexy element of what needs to be done is to build a software architecture that makes it so a clinician can easily assign um, some type of touch or some type of scent to an object in a virtual world. And you don't have to be a programmer to do that. Um, and I know that was one of the pluses since I, I haven't worked with you yet, Joe, yet. 
Um, but with, uh, with Aaron, uh, very impressed with, um, with your uh, SDK uh, for assigning scent to objects and areas, but not just, you know, one-to-one -one mapping, you know, walk within a barrier and you smell the campfire, but, you know, the dispersion of the scent. And, and the, it really, when I first saw that, I was impressed with your... Um, uh, awareness that it wasn't just hitting people over the head with a sledgehammer um, or hitting them in the nose with a sledgehammer. It was a nuance to delivering scent in these environments and to do it in a usable fashion with, uh, with good software. That's the stuff people don't, uh, you know, when you do demos and they don't think so much about it uh, on the surface, but that, that's, the, that's the heavy lift there, making this stuff usable. Um, if there's another question, I'd like to invite that, but if, if nobody jumps in, uh, my question is, what do researchers that want to partner with you have to do? And, you know, roughly, what are the kind of costs that you're looking at right now? Uh, but let's save that. I don't want to gobble up the time. Are there other questions here from the audience? So my camera I can't uh, be the only brave soul here. Wave my hand. Um, I've actually had to. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Cool. Hey, Joe. You're on, Doug. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I've actually had a, a chance to, to try haptics early on um, when I was with Boeing, um, XR in-house creative team. <clears throat> um, it, it's phenomenal. It's mind-blowing. And um, as I was listening to these presentations, um, uh, there were, I was taking notes, obviously, as you can see. Um, there were several mentions to the Olympic, uh, Olympic system. And, and, and often in my presentations, when we didn't parse all this stuff together in, you know, 2014, 2015, when I'm sitting in front of stakeholders, the way that I described um, an XR experience um, is, is your brain putting pieces of an experience together for you. Um, it's kind of, a way of describing it is kind of like um, when, you're, when your brain takes over in fight or flight, right? Because we're still all cave people, really. Um, uh, when our brain decides to take over and make up the, the uh, surroundings uh, for us. And when I describe it to family members or when I describe it to stakeholders, um, you can talk about resolution, you can talk about uh, haptic feedback, but um, no matter how many levels there are to the experience with smell or haptic feedback or visuals, um, it's, it's your brain and your imagination. Um, some of it people don't, haven't even unlocked um, that, that create that environment for you. And it's, you just have to nudge them in the right way. Like for instance, when uh, we're doing uh, flight training or um, any number of other things I can't mention, um, <laughs> you only have to show the aircraft slightly tilting and the body already goes in that motion, right? Your brain is just putting all of this together automatically, automagically. Um, and, and harnessing that through these different um, hardware devices, external hardware devices, is going to be the key to um, their success, right? Um, we already have Facebook and Oculus making it almost ubiquitous, right? So you can see behind me, I have, you know, <laughs> my Oculus Go, my Oculus Quest 1, Oculus Quest 2. Um, and right now, um, speaking of the lexicon, um, it's important for us uh, all to, uh, when we talk about this new technology, um, that we refer to the umbrella term XR, right? It's all encompassing. And uh, VR, um, which we talked about today, um, is, is its own component. But um, even what, last week they um, announced for the Oculus that it's, it's an actual pass through, right? So, this, I'm, a, I'm a little bit mindful of time. Um, as, as, this, as this device is actually, you know, with the, the cameras that it has, is actually an MR device. So it's, it's, it's all coming into one kind of uh, stream uh, or experience with an HMD, a head mounted display. And that, you know, we can actually see our keyboard and interact with the, with the world, even though that this plate is in front of us, right? So I think that's, I think that's all interesting. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's all. That's all I have to say about that. 
Can I get a quick answer from you guys on the research uh, opportunities, uh, partnerships, and what estimate, rough, if you're comfortable, rough costs, uh, and so on? Sorry, Skip, can you say the question one more time? Well, I, yeah. I'll, I'll, let, let me jump in and answer it, and I think you'll pick it up. The, the question yeah. that I heard was, um, what would it take to, for a, a university or, or some an organization to, to collaborate uh, on a research level? What would the cost be and, and then other considerations? And you know, for Haptex, we're um, we're finally to the point where we have the the flexibility with hardware and with people and resources to collaborate with a select number of researchers and and universities and just institutions. So we're we're starting to put together um, a few projects that that will you know do interesting ask interesting questions and come up with fascinating results about you know how touch impacts a particular type of you know of, of vr interaction so we're, we we are we're we're finally able after after years of wanting to, to to have those discussions and keep costs manageable so get in touch with us please if that's of interest to you uh, I have a pretty similar answer, you know, in addition to the, the medical study um, that was done recently, we're involved in a, uh, a few other uh, research projects, uh, mostly in the kind of health and wellness bucket, but, you know, it's really important that good research gets done around all VR technologies and applications, um, and we're really interested in supporting as much good research as we are able to. Um, and so, you know, we have kind of like a baseline research uh, developer kit uh, situation. Um, so I encourage anyone who is interested in doing research to also get in touch with us. And I can describe that in a little bit more detail on how we support research um, and what the possibilities are. And your email's in the chat so people can- read. Yeah, I dropped my email in the chat um, and uh, you can always find us at ovrtechnology.com. Great. Okay. Well, um, you know, uh, this has been fascinating. Uh, you know, I learned a lot today and uh, um, I want to thank you guys, not only for taking the time to do this today, but for having the uh, courage to take on a hard problem and to um, try to expand the boundaries of what we can do in this great field and make a difference for people. So uh, thank you for that. And uh Round of applause for our speakers and Julie, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you all so much for coming today. And thank you, Joe and Aaron, for your wonderful presentations. I put a couple links in the chat. So we will have a recording available of this talk at our official YouTube channel. And you can also stay up to date with future events at our main website, um, which is also in the chat. All righty. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Skip. Thanks, Joe. Thank Thanks you, everyone. Well, Great seeing you. Friday Appreciate it. Good Friday and weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.